The world of finance can be so confusing. It is difficult to understand the difference between commercial and investment banking, between the big four advisory firms and consulting firms, between corporate finance and investment finance. Terms like post-merger integration, commercial lending, credit analysis, assurance, forensics, and private equity could lead you to believe that this is a super complicated area that you will never understand. But it isn't. It's a fairly logical, clearly structured, and fascinating field. And by the end of this video, you will have an idea about who does what in the world of finance. We'll cover a great deal of information in a short amount of time, but our schematic approach will make things clear to you. The best way to understand the finance industry and the different roles in it is through a practical example. We'll describe how different finance professionals can help a company throughout its life cycle. Naturally, a company needs to evolve in each stage of its growth path. Therefore, professionals with a different degree of specialization must be involved. What we'll do here is go through the stages of the company lifecycle model and describe what happens in each of them, giving an idea of why the company needs to hire finance professionals in-house or work with an external firm providing specialized financial services. The lifecycle model is straightforward a company could potentially go through several stages throughout its life. Startup, growing firm, enterprise, large enterprise, and distressed firm. If we have to depict its revenue development during each of these stages over time, most typically it will take a similar shape to this one. A startup company doesn't have many sales. Its major goal is to validate the product and verify the business model. Then, if all goes well in terms of product development and product market fit, revenue increases quickly, within a few months as the company transitions into the growth stage. Typically, during this period, the business needs additional resources to invest in production, working capital, and a growing personnel cost. After a couple of years, or less, the firm becomes a profitable enterprise with well-established processes aiming to improve operational performance and efficiency while competing for market share. Eventually, solid management could allow the enterprise firm to most likely expand overseas or further penetrate its domestic markets and, hence, become a large enterprise. Seeing how a startup gradually becomes a large enterprise is a beautiful thing. But first, it takes a great entrepreneur and excellent management team to get there. And yet, as it frequently happens in life, things don't always go as planned. Sometimes organizations face adverse external conditions or experience internal turmoil and make the wrong strategic moves. So we must say that the decline phase is a possibility too. Of course, a distressed firm can either go bankrupt or turn things around, back to the enterprise or large enterprise stage. Sometimes distressed companies make for good acquisition targets by other large firms because of their low price at that given moment. A managing director at Goldman Sachs once referred to this type of deal as buying weakness. To depict all of the concepts we want to discuss and have clear structure, we created an infographic which summarizes the different types of financial activities and operations a company might encounter throughout its life cycle. Some of them happen internally, inside the organization, while others externally. These are interactions with entities providing different types of financial services. This is the first main distinction we can make. As you can see, horizontally the infographic is divided in two main parts, internal and external activities. Vertically, we'll have the company lifecycle stages. In each of these phases, a company would need to perform different types of financial activities and use different types of external financial services. All right, let's start with our example. So, at the beginning of our story, we have an entrepreneur who wants to open a fashion company. Francesca is Italian, holds a business degree from the United States, and naturally has impeccable taste. Moreover, her close friend Fabrizio is a talented designer. One summer evening, when both of them are in Milan, they have an animated conversation over dinner about a company that sells accessories and shoes for modern women. The very next day, full of enthusiasm and hope, 
Francesca and Fabrizio filed documents to register a legal entity called Borse and Scarpe. As the French philosopher Albert Camus said, great works are often born on a street corner or in a restaurant's revolving door. This was certainly the case here. Of course, building a business is an expensive endeavor. Luckily, Francesca and Fabrizio have some savings and are able to contribute 50,000 euros each. The sum serves as the initial equity needed to fund their new firm, of which the two partners will own an equal share. As for the actual process, the initial plan is to start by focusing on three key aspects. Find a factory, work on the first line of bags, and raise funds from investors. Francesca traveled to the south of Italy to find suitable factories willing to work with a startup company and are open to accepting relatively small initial orders. Ideally, they would have helped other brands create their prototypes in the past. Meanwhile, Fabrizio stays in Milan and works on Borse and Scarpe's first line of bags. The strategy is to start with only one product line, producing bags only, then gradually expand the firm's portfolio when they have the necessary resources to do that. Speaking of resources, Francesca is convinced that the company needs to raise funds from investors because the $100,000 euro initial capital is not sufficient to cover all the production costs, traveling expenses, salaries, and the marketing costs that will have to be sustained. For this reason, she's eager to find investors who are willing to finance early-stage businesses in the fashion industry. In other words, Francesca is looking for a venture capital VC firm to bring on board. The first few meetings Borse and Scarpe have with VC funds are not successful. As a result, Francesca decides to talk to a commercial bank and see if they'd be willing to finance them with a loan. A common practice when a small company applies for a loan is to seek financing from an external source. This is where the firm's first interaction with external parties happens. Francesca will have an exploratory meeting with a credit analyst whose role is to assess whether the firm is a reliable borrower. Francesca makes an appointment at a local branch, where she schedules an interview with one of the bank's credit analysts. Usually, during such a meeting, the lender would ask a number of standard questions. Does your business generate a positive cash flow? Was the first item on his list. We don't have any revenue, so I don't think we do, Francesca replied. Does your business own tangible assets, land, properties, buildings, or equipment that can be used as a guarantee you'll repay the loan? The credit analyst continued. No, we don't. All we have is our limited savings and a mutual desire to put this business in motion, said Francesca. Of course, I understand, nodded the credit analyst. In that case, do you think that there's a wealthy person, perhaps a friend or relative, who will be willing to sign as a co-guarantor so that we can take recourse against them if you are unwilling to repay the given loan. Francesca smiled and replied, I'm not sure we can ask such a gesture from someone. We don't want to put anyone at risk. I understand your position. However, in this case, I must say that it is very unlikely that we'll be able to finance your business. We don't have any sort of collateral to ensure you'll pay us back. Without elaborating further, the credit analyst meant that a commercial bank typically needs a high degree of certainty that the borrower will be able to repay the loan. The bank tries to identify good borrowers, lend them money, and charge some interest on the amount they have lent. That's their business model. Francesca nods in gratitude for the meeting. She understands that commercial banks don't give money to small companies without any assets that can be pledged as collateral. but. At the same time, she feels desperate. A few weeks go by, and the two friends have to spend money on several occasions. Train and taxi tickets, dinner, hotels, sketching boards, legal expenses. So, to put everything in order and track all types of costs, and hopefully revenue in the future, Francesca and Fabrizio realize they need to hire an accountant. Since they can't afford a full-time professional, the two hire an external accountant, who deals with the administration of several small companies, charging each of them an affordable, fixed monthly fee. As luck would have it, the accountant is also very well connected with different VCs in Milan, 
Many of the small companies he has worked with in the past have needed early-stage financing as well. So, after learning of their current situation, the accountant introduces Francesca and Fabrizio to a promising venture capital firm, specializing in Italian fashion startups. The VC investor greets them with open arms. You are in luck. A few days ago, we launched our company's latest fund, he says. We raised 40 million euros from several financial institutions and wealthy individuals. Our goal is to find sustainable investment targets in the fashion and consumer goods sectors over the next 18 months. As you know, our VC firm specializes in fashion. The average investment we're looking to make with this fund is 1 million euros. However, you'll need to send us a solid pitch deck and please make sure to include some numbers. This would help us to assess the feasibility of what you're trying to do. At the end of the meeting, Francesca and Fabrizio feel encouraged and slightly intimidated. VC firms screen hundreds of applicants, and nothing short of an excellent pitch deck will allow the budding entrepreneurs to acquire the much-needed equity financing. Ultimately, Francesca takes matters into her own hands. Thanks to her business studies, she knows how to prepare a pitch deck and what investors want to see. An explanation of a problem people have and that the company is trying to address, as well as the solution and an estimate of the market size. Finally, investors want to know what differentiates the firm's products from the ones offered by other companies. In the last slide of her presentation, Francesca indicates that Borse and Scarpe are looking for a 1 million euro investment, which would be sufficient for the next 12 months and allow the company to reach a revenue of around 1.5 million euro. According to the Roman philosopher Seneca, luck is when preparation meets opportunity. And in this case, we can say that Francesca and Fabrizio got lucky. They received the financing. This wouldn't have been possible if Fabrizio didn't impress the investors with his understanding of the target market demonstrated in the presentation. This, in combination with Francesca's business preparation and drive for success, convinced the VC firm that Borse and Scarpe is a company worth betting on. The fresh funds meant that Fabrizio and Francesca will be able to hire a few people in their startup and put their plans in motion. In addition, the two co-founders, also now co-CEOs of the company, stipulate a contract with one of the factories Francesca found in her initial research. While it isn't the cheapest choice, it offers great quality at an acceptable price. After a number of iterations with sample bags and extensive conversations with focus groups who tried the samples, Fabrizio gives the green light for the factory to produce 10,000 bags of the firm's first model. And so, Borse and Scarpe have a product to sell to their clients after all. Francesca and Fabrizio initiate their sales efforts, recruit a few more people to help with production, accounting, and general administration, and, towards the end of the year, feel very optimistic and satisfied with how things are going. At a certain point, the VC fund calls to inform the two business partners that they need to provide an audited financial statement at the end of each year, standard for all portfolio companies in which the fund has invested. The firm's relatively small size means that the audit would be done fairly quickly, and in this way, the VC fund and its investors could rest assured that the financial statements have been verified by a reputable audit company, as Francesca and Fabrizio were advised to hire one of the big four auditing firms. KPMG, PwC, Deloitte, or Ernst & Young. According to the VCs, their services are more expensive than those of smaller audit firms, but their stamp of approval will mean more going forward. As a result, Borse and Scarpe hire one of the big four companies as their auditor. Over the next year, the company's business continues to grow. Several new lines of shoes and bags enter production. Retail clients and wholesalers indicate that women love Borse and Scarpe's high-quality, modern-looking Italian products. What is more, often the sales team can't fulfill client orders as they are out of stock and don't have sufficient funds to reorder at the time. Francesca and Fabrizio become aware of one important trend. The more the business grows, the bigger their capital needs become. 
Think of our working capital as the following equation. Inventory plus trade receivable minus trade payable, Francesca tells Fabrizio. Inventory eats up working capital. So does the money that we ought to receive from clients but have not yet received, otherwise known as accounts receivable. We are able to partially offset this by delaying payments to suppliers. Fabrizio nods, then says, but we can't stall payments to the factory because they're a family business and rely heavily on us to pay their workers. Exactly, Francesca agrees. So, the more our business grows, the more inventory we will need, and the more money will be locked with wholesaler clients who will delay their payments. Both of them know that it is time to raise an additional round of financing from VCs. The good thing is that this is precisely the situation VCs want to be involved in. A fast-growing business that is capital-hungry with bold founders who are willing to ask for additional funding. To avoid diluting their initial investment, the VC fund, which provided the so-called seed financing to Borse and Scarpe, offers an additional 3 million euro sum rather quickly. They called this round a Series A financing. Francesca and Fabrizio mean to use the money for working capital needs, as well as to expand their team with marketing, sales, logistics, and finance personnel. In terms of finance and accounting, the situation has now grown outside the external accountant's comfort zone. Various requests now require more time to be executed. Moreover, Francesca doesn't feel comfortable operating without having clear visibility on profitability margins, growth rates per product, and the development of various types of costs. Hence, it becomes clear that hiring a finance manager is necessary. The manager will then have to recruit a team of three people. A full-time internal accountant to replace the external accountant working part-time, a financial analyst to study revenue growth, profitability, and volumes sold to different cities, a treasury specialist to monitor cash flows and handle invoicing. Ideally, the newly hired finance manager will put everything in order and introduce some best practices when it comes to each of the activities carried out by people in the finance team. Over time, as the firm's business grows, this solid foundation will help build a profitable company by providing data to facilitate decision-making and keep executives' focus on profitability margins. A few months after receiving the second round of financing, Borse and Scarpe receive a call from their commercial bank. The firm now qualifies as a premium banking client. In essence, premium banking is a service designed for wealthy and promising clients, the corporate banker explains. Some of the benefits for the firms involved are the ability to contact a personal relationship manager, priority handling, and bank products and services under special conditions. This is an interesting invitation. We should go and meet them, Francesca tells her finance manager. A few days later, they schedule a meeting, and Borse and Scarpe are assigned their first corporate banker, who is eager to learn more about the company and lay the foundations of a long-term relationship. Once he understands what the company needs, the banker explains that naturally the bank isn't interested in an equity investment, which means buying a portion of the firm, but would love to support the business through other debt-type services. For example, a revolving loan for working capital, a product which, similarly to an overdraft, offers funds depending on the firm's needs throughout the year. Essentially, when Borse and Scarpe's clients pay their invoices, money would be repaid in the revolving loan account. In addition, Borse and Scarpe's private banker offers to help in case the company decides to buy its own real estate locations in order to build flagship brand stores. This topic hits a soft spot for Francesca, as she has always dreamed of building a fashion business strong enough to afford its own locations in urban centers. She nods and says that they will have to follow up on that once she has a conversation with Fabrizio and their investors. On the way back, Francesca sits in the car and thinks about the private banker's suggestion. How fantastic it would be to see Borse and Scarpe on a storefront while on a Sunday walk in the city center. But then she turns to the finance manager and asks, How is everything coming along with the finance team? Are you happy with the progress that you've made? The finance manager doesn't answer immediately. Instead, he takes his time to reflect and provide accurate information. 
I think we are almost there. It's just that there appears to be some confusion between the financial analyst and the treasury specialist. There were a few situations when it wasn't clear who should be doing what. To fix that, I provided some very narrow guidelines. The treasurer should monitor incoming and outgoing cash flows, prepare a forecast for the firm's 7- and 30-day cash balance, ensure payments to suppliers are sent in a timely manner, and track receivables from clients, as well as following up with them when necessary. On the other hand, the financial analyst is expected to study all drivers of profitability, volume, sales prices, revenue, disaggregate different types of revenue, costs, monitor the nature of expenses, study profitability per product, forecast demand, and work with me to prepare a budget for future periods. This is how we've divided our work at the moment. I think we're in a good place. Francesca nods and thinks to herself, Indeed, and what an exciting place to be in. In the following year, the business continues to grow. New product lines come out, which help reach even more wholesalers. Borse and Scarpe establish themselves as an up-and-coming brand, with very positive reviews from critics and trendy influencers coming in. Revenues are expected to surpass 15 million euros, with a solid EBITDA, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization profitability of around 25%. Unsurprisingly, however, working capital continues to be an issue, and the company has to pay significant interest expenses on the revolving loan provided by the bank, which drains financial resources and lowers bottom-line profitability. In addition, Fabrizio and Francesca establish that they need fresh funds for three projects that keep resurfacing in their discussions. One, buying a firm that specializes in eyewear or perfume production. Two, internalizing production of certain items in-house. And three, investing in flagship brand stores in central city locations. We'll need 50 years to save enough money for each project, and that's excluding our growing working capital needs, Francesca says. Fabrizio, in turn, reasons with his business partner. Well, we certainly can't wait 50 years, can we? Heck, we can't wait even two. Our competitors will be miles ahead. So, what can we do? Let's talk to the VC guys and try to raise additional capital. I agree, Francesca nods. We need fresh funds to accelerate our growth, and the time is right. A few days later, Francesca and Fabrizio meet with their main contact from the VC fund. He congratulates them on the success the business has had, stating that they were one of his favorite portfolio companies. There is some bad news that follows. Unfortunately, the VC fund wouldn't be able to participate in Borse and Scarpe's next investment round, as it is significantly outside the admissible deal size range. Currently, your company is growing very rapidly, and with an annual revenue above 15 million euro, it should be valued in the range between 100 and 150 million euros. You're looking to raise capital in exchange for 20% equity in the business, which translates into a financing check in the region of 20 to 30 million euros. This is great, but unfortunately, it is outside our range. Our investors have given us a mandate to fund early-stage companies, and we can't concentrate this many resources on one business. While we'll prefer to hold our shares with you guys, we wouldn't be able to provide financing this time, the investor concludes. He follows up with a recommendation of two private equity funds he can put the business partners in touch with. Francesca and Fabrizio gladly accept, expressing serious interest. However, both provide a valuation that is not only on the lower side of the range indicated by the VC investor, but even slightly under. According to the two funds, the company is worth 85 and 95 million, respectively. Francesca and Fabrizio realize they need professional advice. After all, a specialized advisory firm that can help them raise money at the right price would create a lot of value in a large transaction. Yet, Selecting an investment bank when you're a small to mid-sized company isn't that easy. Top-tier firms like Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan, and Morgan Stanley prefer to work with large clients, whereas tiny boutique investment banks have less bargaining power on the negotiating table. 
After careful research and several meetings, Francesca makes up her mind on the investment bank they will work with and puts them in touch with the private equity fund. Once an experienced advisor enters the negotiation, things become much easier. The conversation quickly addresses the elephant in the room, the large valuation difference between the two parties. Thanks to their advisors, Francesca and Fabrizio can see that the fund has valued their business very conservatively, with low growth rates and conservative profitability margins. Also, the investment bank uses the method of transaction multiples, a comparison with similar deals that occurred in the fashion industry, to demonstrate that the equity price of the firm prior to receiving the fund's investment should be $150 million. Eventually, the two parties shake hands at a pre-money valuation of 140 million euros and conclude the deal. Borse and Scarpe manage to acquire the funds that would allow them to expand even further into an enterprise. Meanwhile, the private equity fund now owns 20%. Right after the company announced that they have entered a deal to acquire financing, they receive an interesting offer. The founder of Certo a well-reputed company in the cosmetics and makeup business, who knows Francesca and Fabrizio socially, calls them, asking for a meeting. I want to say that I'm very impressed with the success you guys have had at Borse and Scarpe. In a few years, you have managed to grow so much and build an impressive organization. So I'll cut to the chase. I want to retire and sell Certo to the right people. The two of you are at the top of my list. Yes, my company hasn't performed well financially in the last few years, but at the same time, the value is there. I have a brand, distribution channels, and production know-how when it comes to perfumes and makeup. So, what do you say? Does this sound like an interesting opportunity? Needless to say, Francesca and Fabrizio don't manage to hide their enthusiasm. This is precisely the target company they've been looking to acquire. So, they express their interest and are quick to call the investment bank as soon as the meeting is over. After a series of conversations, the two sides agree on an acquisition price, valuing Certo at 20 million euros. However, because Certo's financial statements were not audited prior to concluding the deal, Borse and Scarpe commission a buy-side due diligence from their big four advisor. This uncovers a few imprecisions in Certo's finances such as income, which has been recorded as revenue, but doesn't have to do with the nature of the company's business. The owner of the firm, who acted as CEO, didn't receive a salary commensurate to his experience, and a few other details. When these aspects are taken into account, the parties agree to reduce the selling price to 18 million euros and sign the deal. Francesca and Fabrizio quickly realize that merging two companies is a complex process. This is something we haven't done before, so we have little to no knowledge how to proceed. We're counting on integrating Certo and taking the most out of their expertise in certain areas. So we can't make mistakes, Francesca states. And Fabrizio couldn't agree more. The partner at the Big Four company, which carried out buy-side due diligence, knows that integration is another major challenge for acquiring companies. So, he recommends a specialized team inside their organization that only deals with post-merger integration. They will be able to help Borse and Scarpe with the unification of processes and operating systems, sync different types of business and financial reporting, and, quite importantly, build a unified organizational structure that puts the two entities together. The art of a successful post-merger integration is in achieving a synergy between the two businesses, which has been identified prior to executing the deal. A few months later, everyone is able to take a breath and say quietly that the acquisition was a success. The help from specialized advisors has proved indispensable in this case as well. This is how Borse and Scarpe becomes an enterprise. Their business grows in scale which results in cheaper production due to economies of scale, as well as easier distribution access to more wholesalers, increased marketing and PR budgets, reinforcing the brand even further. All of this allows the company to generate positive cash flows and, in turn, enables their investment in flagship stores in big cities around Europe.
Meanwhile, the company's top management understands that the business has grown and the organization needs to grow with it. Now, Borse and Scarpe is in a position to reinforce each of its divisions and add more specialized personnel. In the finance team, the manager becomes chief financial officer, CFO. Additionally, several new roles appear next to the existing ones. Controlling, account receivables and account payables in accounting. Working capital analysis, financial planning and analysis, as well as financial analysts focusing on specific items like revenue, costs, balance sheet, and so on. Here's what individuals in each of these new roles are supposed to do. Financial controllers are the ones who monitor different types of costs, production, logistics, marketing, selling, and admin costs, and allocate shared expenses from these activities among different product lines. Think of a factory that produces different product lines. However, each of these share electricity, rent, as well as other expenses sustained at a central level. In essence, Financial controllers help management uncover the true costs for the creation of a product by taking into consideration all costs necessary for its production, and, therefore, this allows management to understand each product's true profitability. Controllers monitor the amount of input necessary to produce a standard unit of a given item and are able to report these figures to management. In this way, they understand the true cost behind a pair of shoes, a given type of bag, and monitor production efficiency. An ever-increasing number of wholesale clients means that Borse and Scarpe needs a dedicated accounts receivable team, responsible for issuing invoices to clients and monitoring the timeliness of expected payments. If necessary, this team will communicate with the client's accounting or treasury division to remind them about unpaid invoices. In the accounts payable team, on the other hand, a couple of newly hired clerks are tasked with handling supplier invoices. In any case, both the accounts receivable and accounts payable teams function within the larger accounting department of the company's finance division. Given that working capital is one of the critical issues for the business, and this isn't expected to change anytime soon, the company's CFO decides to hire a dedicated working capital manager whose main priorities are accounts receivable, accounts payable, and inventory. Her goal is to work with each of these teams to minimize inventory, decrease accounts receivable, asking clients to pay sooner when possible, and negotiate longer payment terms with suppliers. In the new structure of the finance team, financial analysts have much more granular tasks. One analyzes revenue from domestic clients, while another revenue from foreign clients. A third analyst is focused on brand performance, while a fourth studies balance sheet items. In the meanwhile, all of them report to a senior financial analyst, who, in turn, reports to the CFO. And finally, an important new position created after the expansion of the company is the one for financial planning and analysis. This includes a few experts who are tasked with forecasting revenue and expenses, building a budget, and comparing it with actual figures and forecasts. Moreover, their role is to work closely with the team managers within the organization and advise them on how to plan resources efficiently. Rest assured, the robust structure of Borse and Scarpe's finance team will facilitate the company's sustainable growth in the years to come. When a business is growing this fast, it is important to pay attention to profit margins. We don't want to sacrifice profitability for the sake of growth, per se. I appreciate the work you and your team are doing to ensure that, Francesca tells her CFO during one of their conversations. The company's success is truly remarkable. In the next 12 months, Borse and Scarpe managed to establish themselves as a household name in Europe, build a solid brand, be considered a large enterprise, and become profitable with an impressive EBITDA margin of slightly more than 27%, which is considered higher than the industry average of 15%. Not long after, Several investment banks invite Francesca and Fabrizio to entertain the company's listing on the Italian stock exchange. 
And although the two co-founders don't know which bank would run their initial public offering, or IPO, both of them agree that it is time for this long-awaited next step and take the company public. After careful consideration, Francesca, Fabrizio, and a couple of representatives of the private equity fund that invested in the company agree to hire one of the top-tier global investment banks to lead the IPO. At the price of a slightly higher commission, they'll be able to benefit from the bank's strong certification effect, their extensive relationships with investor firms around the world, and a solid track record when it comes to running successful IPOs. The road to a successful IPO begins months before we start talking to investors, the senior investment banker in charge of the transaction explains. Solid preparations will make our work much easier down the road. We need to address several important topics as well, he continues. The investment bank advisors encourage the firm to create processes and hire in-house independent auditors to improve internal control mechanisms, as well as legal compliance. So, they will hire internal auditors and risk management analysts who will put certain best practice corporate governance controls in place and answer to the CFO. The main task of the internal auditor is to be an independent body that works within the organization to ensure that the managers and the different teams operate effectively, respecting corporate governance best practices. Meanwhile, a risk management analyst's role in one company can be very different than that of another from a different company. In Borse and Scarpe's case, the position involves creating fraud prevention procedures, policies against excessive risk-taking by managers in certain situations, and guidelines on establishing procedures of how decisions within different levels of materiality are to be taken within the organization. One of the main deliverables the company needs to carry out the IPO is called a prospectus. Traditionally, a specialized team inside one of the big four companies is commissioned to prepare such a document. The process of drafting a prospectus is similar to a due diligence, but in a more extensive way, providing much more information required by regulatory bodies. The Big Four team works hard to organize financial and other business information according to the requirements defined by financial authorities. With this prospectus, a knowledgeable and sophisticated investor will be able to understand the company's business and form an idea about its fair market value. Of course, each of the work streams that are necessary for the execution of the IPO, drafting the prospectus, legal advisory, hiring new personnel, requires additional financial resources. At the same time, Borse and Scarpe's business continues to grow and working capital needs to be increased in parallel. So, as a source of financing, the company decides to take advantage of the bridge loan that the investment bank offers. In addition, the relationship manager at the commercial bank that Borse and Scarpe has worked with in the past provides favorable terms for accounts receivable financing. As a result, the company will be able to use the money owed by clients sooner, after the bank applies a few percentage points of discount on each invoice. In such a deal, the responsibility of collecting the owed amount transfers to the bank. If the client defaults on a payment, Borse and Scarpe does not bear any risk. Over the years, our relationship manager has helped us so much. We've received preferential rates for deposits, insurances, leases, mortgages, forex trading, and many other types of banking products. We were able to repay with our continued business. This is an excellent relationship, Francesca thinks after a Zoom conversation with their relationship manager, who has found a way to optimize the firm's monthly spend on banking fees. Ultimately, the months prior to the IPO are hectic. This type of process requires everyone to give their best and work much longer hours than usual. One reason for that is because, besides the company's regular operating activity, a significant part of management and the finance team have to support advisors in an effort to prepare the IPO materials and address critical challenges before going public. 
For example, they must manage several work streams, including evaluation of Borse and Scarpe, taking into account the business plan that management has prepared, vendor due diligence, in which the big four company they work with has audited the company's financials and adjusted EBITDA for one-off and extraordinary items, examining and addressing a number of tax and legal issues. As the senior investment banker states, the goal of this much preparatory work is to deal with various concerns that investors might have at the time of the IPO and act preemptively. A crucial responsibility investment bankers have, which is essentially the subtle art of their profession, is to work with management to create a solid plan, a compelling story that can show the growth potential. At the end of the day, this is the only focus investors have in an IPO. They're interested in buying a growth story. It's fundamental that the presentation of the business plan and the stories told by management are in sync. This is why bankers spend a substantial amount of time with Borse and Scarpe's management to help them refine their stories and answer questions about the current and future business of the company to ensure everything aligns perfectly. As the IPO date approaches, the company and the Equity Capital Markets, ECM team of the investment bank arranging the IPO, organize a series of online meetings, some of them as one-on-one -on -one talks with large investment firms, while others in the form of conference calls. Management and the ECM investment bankers present Borse and Scarpe's vision, their business plan, and their financial position including an allocated Q&A segment within each session. At the end, investors express their interest in the offering, as well as the number of shares they'd be willing to buy at different price points. As a result, the investment bank gains an idea about investor demand. In this case, numbers show that the investors are interested in the IPO. The investment bankers receive a higher demand than expected. In response, they raise the price target for Borse and Scarpe, only slightly with respect to the initial range, as to not upset the investors. And so, on the announced day, Borse and Scarpe becomes a publicly traded company, with their shares listed on the Italian stock exchange. Everything goes as planned, and even better, the ticker shows a plus 10% increase with respect to the initial price at the end of the first trading day which is precisely what investment bankers wanted to achieve. What this means is that their valuation was solid. The VC and private equity fund that invested in Borse and Scarpe are ecstatic with the firm's success. At the time of the IPO, they sell a substantial portion of their holdings in the company to retail and institutional investors, such as mutual and pension funds, and achieve amazing return multiples compared to their initial investments in the business. In particular, the VC fund that trusted Francesca and Fabrizio early on achieves a return multiple of over 20 times the initial financing. One of Borse and Scarpe's first tasks as a public company is to build an internal team for investor relations, a necessity for every listed firm as it is responsible for investor communications, delegating with financial authorities on new disclosure requirements, and publishing quarterly and annual presentations when the firm has to report its results to the public. Several investment banks assign research analysts to follow Borse and Scarpe's business and express an opinion on whether their market price reflects fair value. Banks use this kind of work as a marketing tool, that allows them to connect with investment firms looking to learn more about different opportunities in the market. The fact that several banks assign their research analysts on Borse and Scarpe is encouraging, as this means that the company is seen as a potentially interesting opportunity. The resources acquired through the IPO allow the company to boost its expansion even further. Francesca and Fabrizio invest heavily in production, marketing, and retail capabilities. They open several new flagship stores in central locations in the United States and Asia. Without a doubt, Borse and Scarpe has managed to establish itself as a global company in the fashion industry. 
it is safe to conclude that they've entered the large enterprise phase as described in the life cycle model. With more financial resources at their disposal and the shares of the company that can be used as potential acquisition currency, Francesca and Fabrizio have renewed interest in inorganic growth. They create an internal M&A team to screen for suitable acquisition targets whose business aligns with Borse and Scarpe's competitive strategy. In general, the main task of an in-house mergers and acquisition team would be to observe potential targets and execute small transactions without the services of an investment bank. At this point, we should point out that an important change of ownership also took place on the day of the IPO. Borse and Scarpe's main owners became wealth management and pension funds. Francesca and Fabrizio have kept a good portion of their shares, remaining as co-CEOs, but their combined ownership accounts for less than 25% of the firm's outstanding shares. A few months after the IPO, a new board of directors substitutes the old one, provided by representatives of the investment firms that now own the majority of voting shares in the company. The new board has asked Francesca and Fabrizio, as co-CEOs, to be more aggressive and accelerate Borse and Scarpe's revenue growth to boost the share price and satisfy investors who entered at the IPO price. The two suggest that they should reach out to consultants from McKinsey and Company who can develop a plan for top-line growth, to which the board agrees. McKinsey's team of consultants works on-site with the company's top management and studies the business. Eventually, they come up with a plan and outline the steps, but also underline that it would take at least 6 to 12 months to see positive results. In essence, the top-line strategy growth plan suggests the following. To focus on e-commerce and build the necessary infrastructure for a stronger online presence which will grow sales and improve profit margins as e-commerce allows a scalable direct-to-consumer approach. To reward clients for their loyalty and try to increase the number of repeated purchases over time. Try to use alternative marketing channels, social media, such as TikTok, to achieve better results among younger audiences. On one hand, Francesca and Fabrizio are happy with the consultant's work. On the other, the board of directors thinks that the proposed strategy would do well in the mid and long term, but does not answer Borse and Scarpe's short-term revenue growth needs. They make it clear that currently one of the main priorities is to find a way to show the market that the company deserves a higher valuation than current price levels. So, the firm's short-term focus shifts to an initiative that could yield results much sooner. The in-house M&A team comes up with an interesting idea. Buying a sportswear brand or company and selling one of Borse and Scarpe's more affordable brands, which could boost the company's market valuation by expanding. While presenting this idea to the board of directors, one of the members of the in-house M&A team say that there are two ways to carry out the divestment. Either spin off the brand into a separate company and listed on the stock exchange on its own, or, alternatively, divest the brand to a buyer. In general, we can sell to a strategic or a financial buyer, like a fund. However, a strategic buyer is much more likely to be interested in the sale of a single brand. In this case, considering the relatively small dimensions of the brand, Borse and Scarpe decide that the transaction fees would be too high and a spin-off deal is not feasible. Hence, they hire an advisor to carry out the sale, and his first task is to find interested buyers. In addition, they assign one of the big four companies to prepare a vendor due diligence report in order to provide transparency and higher assurance to the companies participating in the auction process. After a long auction process, Borse and Scarpe is able to find a strategic buyer that is interested in acquiring the assets they want to sell, namely a company listed on the London Stock Exchange with a sound balance sheet, willing to offer an attractive price for the acquisition. A few days prior to closing the deal, 
a U.S. hedge fund tries to profit from an arbitrage strategy consisting in buying Borse and Scarpe's shares, or buying the seller and short-selling the shares of the acquirer, known as shorting the buyer. The fund is looking to implement a hedge fund strategy, according to which the deal announcement would trigger an increase in the seller price and a decrease in the buyer price. In general, hedge funds are very short-term focused, hence why, once the deal is closed, the specific U.S. one sells Borse and Scarpe's shares to other investors. The next step of the plan, buying a sportswear brand or company, is put on hold because the internal M&A team has not been able to identify suitable targets. None of the firms they screened match the growth profile Borse and Scarpe is looking for. While Francesca and Fabrizio really like one of the companies, it is a mid to long term bet rather than an immediate boost of revenues. So, even though they plead on several occasions that this is the right move, the new board of directors does not go through with the deal in the end. When it comes to working relationships, a situation like this, in which the two parties want to move the company in a very different direction, could be very dangerous. Francesca and Fabrizio realize that things are not going to work out well in their favor. In truth, they want to do more of what made them successful in the first place. Invest in the brand, expand the company's physical presence in different locations, grow the e-commerce channel, bet on targets that have long-term potential, and, most of all, listen to their own intuition. In fact, they loved the recommendations from McKinsey's top-line strategy work and want to have the time to implement them. On the other hand, the board of directors want to push a different agenda. They are interested in the specific steps that would boost Borse and Scarpe's share price within the next 6 to 12 months. Let's note here that not everyone on the board feels that way, but it's still a majority vote. At this point, both the board and the two co-CEOs know that something has to change. For this reason, Francesca and Fabrizio resign and go on to sell their shares in the company in several batches. Unloading this many shares puts significant pressure on the stock price because, by definition, when you increase supply, the price of an asset goes down if demand remains constant. After the two founders depart, a private equity fund specializing in leverage buyouts, LBO deals, approached Borse and Scarpe's board of directors with an offer to buy the entire company and delist it from the stock market, offering an included 10% premium with respect to the current stock market valuation, which is a pretty modest premium by most standards. Due to losing its leadership and the unclear direction in which the business is heading, the board of directors is convinced they should make good on the offer. Francesca and Fabrizio are surprised that the board of directors accepts the deal and aren't too happy with this development. Yet, there isn't much they can do but observe from the sidelines. The leveraged buyout deal, LBO, is to be financed with 90% debt and 10% equity. Using such high leverage is the reason why we call these deals leveraged buyouts, which will result in Borse and Scarpe's absorbing a huge amount of debt on its balance sheet. The private equity fund hopes that the company will repay such high leverage over time using its positive operating cash flows, which are substantial at this point. Consequently, the CEO they appointed has prior experience with two such deals. She has managed to delever the companies, allowing for an amazing return on investment for the fund. Once the transaction goes through, it becomes clear that some board members will receive significant bonuses for the sale. This makes Francesca reflect on whether they voted in favor to maximize the company's value or instead to trigger poorly designed personal bonuses, which creates a conflict of interest. In general, LBOs are risky deals. Even marginal changes in market conditions can have a serious impact on these transactions due to the high leverage involved. And because the private equity fund financed 90% of the acquisition with debt, 
This leads to significant interest expense payments, even at the low interest rate levels at the time of the deal. But to make things worse, interest rates went up, and interest payments absorb Borse and Scarpe's entire positive operating cash flow result. As a result, a once profitable company becomes loss making at the net income level. To cover these losses, the company borrows additional funds. It's clear that in less than 12 months after the LBO, the firm is in distress and urgent actions are required to restructure the business. If you remember our graph, you'll know what follows. Essentially, this is how Borse and Scarpe enters the distressed firm stage. Eventually, the private equity fund replaces top management with a new CEO and CFO who have extensive experience with restructuring proceedings. One of their first moves is to hire an advisor that specializes in working with distressed firms, a process none of the mid- and high-level executives have any experience with. Once a restructuring advisor comes on board, Borse and Scarpe enters into negotiations with banks and financing entities to suspend interest payments. Moreover, the company's team asks the financing entities to write off a sizable portion of the company's debt. Otherwise, it would go bankrupt, and they would recover a much lower amount, compared to the one they can receive if the restructuring process goes well. Next, the new CEO sells some of the company's real estate assets to unlock many necessary financial funds and buy time while negotiating with lenders. Another interesting development that the new management undertakes is hiring a forensics team from one of the big four companies, tasking them with the investigation of the bonuses received by the board of directors and management team who sold Borse and Scarpe to the LBO fund a firm requirement set by the lender's committee. Moreover, they want to also investigate the previous leadership for fraudulent bankruptcy. Handing the case over to a big four firm is a reasonable way to avoid spending too much energy on the issue and ensure the review of a reputable, independent third party. To no surprise, financial struggles and frequent changes of management come at a cost. Revenues decline year over year, for the first time since the firm's inception. Different wholesale clients are able to squeeze Borse and Scarpe's margins, asking for lower prices because they know the company is in a vulnerable position and cannot afford to lose large distributors. This puts additional pressure on operating cash flows, and the situation is far from ideal. After months of hard work of the restructuring advisory team and the new top management hired for the restructuring process, the company is able to negotiate a write-off of 40% of the loans taken at the time of the LBO. In addition, under the agreed terms, Borse and Scarpe will not pay interest expenses or distribute dividends until achieving certain financial covenants. In the meantime, commercial banks who lent money to Borse and Scarpe sell the remaining portion of their loans to funds specializing in acquiring debt in distressed companies at a discount. The suspended interest rate payments, the proceeds from the sale of valuable real estate, and the relatively stable consumer demand allow restructuring consultants and management to stabilize cash flows and take on a clear path to successful salvation. Finally, the company is on the path to recovery. It must be said that certain hedge funds specialize in buying weakness. In other words, they're able to spot a good opportunity thanks to quantitative analysis and solid connections in the investor community. One such fund notices Borse and Scarpe's potential to return to its previous valuation and presents the lenders and the private equity fund with the idea to acquire the company and refinance its debt. In their offer, they are looking to buy the entire firm at a fraction of the price it was acquired for in the LBO. Naturally, this isn't an optimal solution for the board of directors and the restructuring team, but a viable one nonetheless if they want a quick out of the situation. On their end, Francesca and Fabrizio don't like what is happening to their company. 
as the best owners Borsay and Scarpe ever had, they don't believe anyone else but them would be able to be successful with the company. For this reason, they step in and match the hedge fund's offer, even bidding slightly higher in an effort to win the deal. Meanwhile, the last thing the hedge fund wants to do is enter a bidding war with the two original co-founders, who also have the financial strength to increase the price. Therefore, the investors withdraw their offer, meaning Borse and Scarpe goes in its entirety to the two people who started the business in the first place. Are you ready for Act 2 of our adventure with this business? Francesca asks Fabrizio after they sign the papers for the acquisition. You know I am, and I know you are too. Fabrizio smiles at the thought of reviving the company they have built together. What makes this second round different compared to when they first got into the fashion industry is that Francesca and Fabrizio now have the resources to be independent and know how to play the finance game. After all, that dictates how successful you will be in the world of business nowadays.